Welcome to the Healthcare Executive Podcast, providing you with insightful commentary and developments in the world of healthcare leadership. To learn more, visit ACHE.org. And without further ado, your host, Chris Caraggio. Hey, folks, thank you so much for joining the Healthcare Executive Podcast. I am Chris Caraggio, your host, and our guest today, we're so pleased to have Dr. Indu Sabaya. She is a visionary healthcare leader whose work builds community, creates dialogue, and inspires us to radically rethink how health shapes our lives. So before we get into a nice conversation with Dr. Sabaya, let me tell you a little bit more about her. Back in 2007, Dr. Sabaya co-founded and served as CEO of Health 2.0, a global conference platform and community for the showcase and advancement of new healthcare technologies. Health 2.0's conference business was acquired by the Healthcare Information and Management System Society back in 2017, and in the two years post-acquisition, Dr. Sabaya headed the organization as Executive Vice President. She continues to serve as a senior advisor to HIMSS. Now, in 2013, Fierce Health IT named Dr. Sabaya one of Health Information Technology's most influential women. Then last year, she was selected as a fellow in the Aspen Institute's Health Innovators Fellowship Program. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in Science and Technology Studies from Cornell University and a medical degree from Stony Brook University. Now, deciding to forego medical residency to develop new healthcare dialogues and care models, she received her MBA from the Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley. Now, Dr. Sabaya has served as vice president of the Society of Participatory Medicine and on advisory committees of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and a National Health Data Consortium. She is a member of NextGen Venture Partners and an advisor to Parsley Health, Athletic, and Patient Insight. Dr. Sabaya, thank you so much for joining us and uh, being here on the Healthcare Executive Podcast. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's great to be here. You got it. You got it. Okay. Your your resume, boy, that speaks for itself. Uh, you're very impressive with what you have done in 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 many different ways. But obviously, we're going to focus on 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 healthcare and the leadership aspects of of what you're doing. So let's start. Um, I mentioned healthcare 2.0, more specifically, Catalyst at Health 2.0. Can you really kind of describe the purpose and mission of that organization? Sure. Um- So we've been fortunate over the last, I suppose, 13 years now to grow a community of entrepreneurs. Um, I kind of think of it as a global family, actually, of folks around the world who uh, are using technology in some way to improve health or healthcare. And this could mean, you know, kind of consumer facing technology, or it could be technologies for health systems and enterprise clients. But This community uh, grew up over the last 13 years, uh, in large part because we started with the series of conferences and then added a number of programs that would actually connect this large ecosystem of entrepreneurs to the stakeholders that needed their solutions. So Catalyst's mission today is to really bridge the gap between the needs in health and healthcare and the solution providers that might have answers. Not all the answers, but hopefully uh, at least some of the enabling technologies to bridge those gaps. Okay, so that's the goal, to bridge those gaps, just like you said. Now, with your background um, in science, technology, med school, MBA, all that, um, you kind of you kind of can 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 speak to different industry languages, okay, and, and many of those. So, so for for the um, health 2.0's uh, audience segments, they're kind of connected, even though there's they're they're individual. So it's kind of a dichotomy. Uh, how do you uh, help us understand how that how you pull that off, creating really one language to connect to everybody? You know, I think that that's such an interesting question, and um, I think you know I consider myself uh, the classic jack of all trades uh, and master of none. But I suppose it does come in handy in the space of of digital health and and health transformation, because I think, you know, anybody you ask would would agree that the challenges we face in healthcare today can't just be solved through the medical model alone. It can't just be solved with business and policy thinking. Um, You know, it's not going to be solved just by the private sector or just by government. So I really think you need, um, 
all of these languages to come to get to, to come together. But I think it's like the the Tower of Babel. You know, sometimes people just don't understand each other's languages, and I think you'll see sometimes even um, entrepreneurs who've been working with healthcare stakeholders for years. Um, I would say many, many digital health entrepreneurs now, it's not their first rodeo. They've started, you know, two or three companies. They've worked uh, with large enterprise clients and you will still find the complaint on both sides that um, our cultures are so different. Uh, when we say one thing, uh, you know, we mean one thing, but it's not interpreted that way. So I would say our challenge right now is not just how to fit these technologies in, but how to, like you said, create a language that that people really understand each other through, and that that's harder than it seems. I was going to ask you that 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 seems very challenging. So how how are you navigating through that? So I think you know it sounds kind of simple, but um, you'll be surprised how little people sit down with each other and really talk about the problem they're trying to solve. So what we found um, in some of the work we do at Catalyst when we do some of this matchmaking is it's way more than than reading a company's pitch deck or seeing their tech demo. Um, if you're not spending several hours, if you're not kind of doing site visits and sitting down and meeting each other's team members, it, it, these are decisions that can't really come down to the just the CEO to CEO level. Um, it's got to come down to entire teams, the frontline staff on both sides, meeting each other, sitting down. Um, you'll sometimes hear people say, you know, we really want to actually share definitions. We want to educate each other on what we mean by I'm dealing now with the mental health um, uh, sort of opportunity where we want digital health to solve a lot of the mental health issues. Folks wanted to actually share what they meant by a peer. Uh, so that if there was going to be a text messaging platform, what do we mean by by peer support? So sometimes just sharing definitions explicitly, um, having your team members meet up and down the organizational chart, um, all of those things help. So we do a ton of work, I think, on the front end um, to make sure we have the same goals. And then I think some of these partnerships have the most chance of success. Yeah, a ton of work. I think that's a severe understatement. So um, you're tackling that challenge. Tell me this, doctor, what does health data mean in your world, that term? It means, uh, I mean, it means so much. Yes. I think that, um, you know... Because you've it's, referred to it as, as at its own economy is why, is why we're asking. Because um, yeah. it is a broad term, but to you specifically, what does that mean? So I would say that when I think of health data, I think of anything that is coming out of um, any type of computable system. And that could be, you know, your Fitbit, it could be your phone, it could be the sensor that's tracking your steps um, that, that's built in now to, you know, Apple iOS and more, all the way to EMR data, um, claims data. It could be data that's coming out of your genome because you've ordered, you know, a 23andMe test. So I think we think of a, a very broad picture of health data when we when we talk about health data. I think the health data economy um, is something that um, we collectively as an industry have to really try to get our arms around right now. I think it's it's in some ways kind of gone off the rails. <laughs> and you're hearing a lot of people talk about the entry of large technology platforms like the Googles of the world and the Amazons um, and what this has meant for accelerating, I think, what was already an economy where health data was being bought and sold. But now we've sort of turbocharged that. And um, as we start to take advantage of partnerships in cloud computing by working with some of these large players, we're facing some of the same challenges that you're hearing in the consumer world around personal data, right? What rights does Facebook have over my data? Um, do I know uh, where it's being used and how it's being used? Is it being monetized? And if it's being monetized, what's the value back to me um, as the, the citizen? So we're hearing these same conversations really get taken to the next level in healthcare today because health data is sold and bought. Um, and it's 
sometimes being done very openly and very transparently, legally, in fact. Um, so I think, you know, there was there was a piece just in the in, in the news yesterday around uh, Google working with Ascension's data and it being perfectly HIPAA compliant. And yet people were concerned because, you know, patients and doctors did not feel they were informed ahead of time. We've seen acquisitions by Roche uh, and others, pharma companies who've bought EMR uh, companies like Flatiron Health for Oncology. And you've had oncologists say, you know, I kind of didn't know (laughs) at the time I was putting in that data that it was going to end up in a pharma company. So it's not to point fingers at any one business, but it is to raise the question of uh, we know health data has value. It's moving. Um, The more we bring in technology, the more potential there is for data to to move. And and what does that mean for my rights as a patient and a provider, you know, as to the transparency, the level of control I have over that? Yep. And you kind of answered it, but let's take it a little step further because you you mentioned it it just... It's so much each and every day, the technologies and the innovations. Um, if you put it all together, what, what, what took place in the past, what's taking place now, what, what to expect come the future. Um, and then you have to talk about that discovery process needed to connect the right technologies. Like you talked about, just being able to speak the same language, the communication to for everybody to get on the same page for a desired outcome. So um, specifically talking about healthcare leadership and health system leadership, how how can how can this exploration process be used to identify their needs? So I think it's it's a good time. Uh, the industry has really matured, I would say, over the last decade, where uh, it's not the first time that health systems are thinking about innovation and thinking about how new technology can help. Um, in fact, sometimes the challenge I think for health systems now is there's so much out there you know, how do I begin? Where do I begin? How do I figure out the quality uh, over the quantity? What is the signal to noise? Uh, Is something really going to be a fit for me? Uh, Am I spending the right amount of money? You know, is this going to be cost effective? Am I going to get the results that I want? So I think we're at a place now where it's not a question of whether there are solutions out there that can help. It's it's how do you choose the right ones um, and what's the best decision for the value. So I think um, that, you know, one of the things we're seeing work well is when health systems have already identified a few strategic areas in their strategic roadmap. And most health systems will set these every, you know, if it's once every five years or once every three years, but certainly there should be a mapping done of the strategic priority areas that that a hospital has set up um, and then say, okay, if we want to tackle, you know, uh, care in the home, or we really want to tackle diabetes prevention, uh, or we want to figure out, you know, children's uh, high needs issues, then I would say it starts with that. You've already identified it as a strategic priority for your health system. And then I think you look at the ecosystem of solutions out there addressing that. And you do that in a systematic way. Um, We're often surprised at how sometimes, um, and and here we are in the business of looking at new technology every day. That's like our day jobs. And you'll see companies popping up, you know, in Finland, (laughs) in in India, that are um, absolutely relevant for a solution in this country, but, you know, who knew? So I think it's taking a global look um, and it's doing a comprehensive look at what's out there in your space. And then uh, it's literally like almost like college applications, right? Like interviewing uh, these companies, getting to understand if there's a cultural fit, um, what is their business model, uh, how do they handle data, kind of putting them through, through the rigorous sort of questions and then hopefully coming up with the solutions. I would also say, Many health systems are building their own technologies and they're saying, you know, we really understand what we need. We don't need to go into the outside market. So how do you do that internally? Maybe you have uh, clinician entrepreneurs that want to develop something in-house. So I think it's it's a combination of looking at the strategic priority, looking what's at, at what's out there, at what's out there in the world, and then asking, could we do this better here? Uh, and if not, 
figuring out, you know, uh, a pretty rigorous protocol for for vetting uh, these partners and then hopefully coming together. Okay, great. That's a lot, a lot in there for people to take in. And like you said, you can customize. There's different options. Um, let, let, let's, let's shift more specifically now to talking about maybe um, rural hospitals, obviously the smaller type hospitals. If you could give your advice, because these folks are facing, obviously they have, they have smaller budgets, but, but their, you know, their patient base may be, you know, vast over, over a large uh, geography. Okay. They got, you know, a lot of patients are coming from a lot of different areas, but again, the budget is small. How, how are these folks, these, these hospital people, these administrators, these leaders, how are they, um, you know, kind of implementing this exploration process? Is it different than a, than a larger hospital in a, in a more urban area? I do think that, I do think the challenges are, are very different. Um, I think that in some ways uh, we have a problem of having the physical space, uh, which is a great thing. It's a great asset to actually have the capital infrastructure um, for physical hospital space, but we're often facing just a lack of number of people coming through the door. So ironically, you know, when you hear about trying to save money and trying to prevent, you know, ER admissions and keep folks out of the hospital, I think rural hospitals face the other challenge. It's like, you know, we don't have enough people coming in. And when they do come in, the reimbursement models are just not sufficient for us to keep our doors open. So I think they almost need a hybrid approach um, to when, when thinking about how to use health technologies. Um, if all of their technology were simply keeping people away, we, we wouldn't have a mechanism uh, to really treat patients in the facility and to, to get reimbursed and to, and to stay in business. So are there ways in which uh, we could use telemedicine, so still set up shop in the rural hospital with the facilities to do telemedicine. But when somebody exceeds the level of being able to be cared for in their home, they can come in. Can we use partnerships with transportation companies, uh, which are now, there are digital health companies that will coordinate transportation um, all on the same sort of electronic dashboard. Um can we build connections from the rural hospital with all of the social service providers in that county so that uh, maybe there's a way that the hospital can be a hub, not just for medical care, but for coordinating health you know, services a- across a particular region. So I think there is some combination of telepresence and coordination with other services in the community that that rural hospitals can can really take advantage of. And I think in terms of the cost, uh, we are seeing now companies in the digital health sector going at risk and saying, you don't have to pay us up front if we save you money or if we help you um, hit a certain kind of financial goal, you'll pay us. We'll share that upside with you. And I think getting into those kind of uh, risk-bearing contracts with these technology partners might be another way to go. Great, great. Okay, let's let's move to this now, doctor. Uh, you know, everything's a business in its own sense. So, you know, healthcare organizations, the management of healthcare, it's competitive because, again, it is a business. But the issues that each organization faces, they're very similar. Okay, it just depends who you work for and who you're, who you're trying to reach. So the question is, since since the, the most common issues, what what are some of the most common issues? I guess is what I'm asking. Are these leaders of the different healthcare management organizations? What how can they come together to just create overall solutions for the betterment of of humanity, if you will? I think that's. It's such a great question, <laughs> and I think there are many, many opportunities. I think when you think about um, – I, th- I think it's case by case. So I think in certain parts of the country and in certain cities and counties and states, um, there is such consolidation that the issue of competing with other health systems isn't so much the issue. It might actually be the fear – that um, or the, or the competition is not with another health system. It might be with 
sort of a retail environment. It might be with a pharmacy chain. It might be with a health plan um, that's buying up kind of provider organizations. So I think when we think of competition today, it's not necessarily just hospital to hospital or health system to health system, but it's also these other players that might be putting up, you know, freestanding minute clinics or urgent care centers or, you know, what are CVS and Walmart doing? So I think it is becoming a much more complicated competitive environment. That said, I think it's time for individual stakeholders in that equation to say, what is my really, really specific value add? What is it that only we we can do and do well? For example, is it the fact that you really have, you know, um, the best uh, cancer care or the best sort of, you know, cardiac um, center, or you really are outstanding on, on, on children's health. So I think it is time to figure out what the centers of excellence are in a community and to collaborate in areas where maybe somebody else can do a better job. Um, and that's tough, but I think it's time to do that because otherwise we're in a situation where there just aren't the resources to go around. And as consumers and as patients, um, we're not necessarily being served by the best possible combination uh, of entities. And we don't, you know, you don't want to sort of lock people into, you can only kind of (laughs) go to me and you can't go down the street if there's a better option. So I think it's one, identifying what you do really well um, and and putting the word out there and then collaborating where you can do better. So for example, here in Los Angeles, uh, we have, you know, for example, something like Cedar sinai It's a world famous um, tertiary health system, but we also have a number of federally, federally qualified health clinics that need a lot of resources and a lot of support. So, you know, Cedars is looking at ways in which they can support the FQHCs in the community and help them with tech infrastructure and, and, and other resources so that, um, you know, we're, they don't really have to compete. They can actually support each other, as you said, for the common good of people who live in Los Angeles. So taking more of that community view. So I think that's one thing. I think there's also tremendous opportunity to work with health systems that you aren't directly competing with. So what prevents, you know, a health system in one state from saying to another health system, what are you doing about the opioid crisis? What are the tech solutions that you're deploying? Um, how can we learn from you? So there, these best practices absolutely ought to be shared, um, especially if there isn't a competitive issue. Uh, there's almost no excuse <laughs> at that point. So uh, we hope, you know, associations like ACHE and others, it's a great opportunity uh, to, to bring folks together to share those best practices and not just, you know, at the policymaking level, at that business level, but at that technology level too, um, what are you learning about your innovation and your experimenting? Um, because this field is changing so fast. So we, we highly recommend that. Yeah, the importance of collaboration on all levels, mo- most most definitely. Okay, last question, final question here. Um, at the beginning, you, you spoke about uh, Catalyst at Health 2.0 and how uh, the, out of the many things you're, you're, you're doing, you know, it has to start with connections, whether it be communication through language or everybody getting on the same page. But ca- that, that word connection, which is something ACHE does with its membership as well, as you know. So uh, ACHE has a major effort to help organizations across the country improve patient safety. So... Um, having that in your mind, what would you say to, to our members on how how their data can achieve that, you know, that, that ultimate patient safety? I think it's incredibly exciting. I, lo- I love talking about this issue. So I think with patient safety, there are at least three dimensions. There must be many more, but three come to mind from my perspective on the health technology landscape. Um, I think that, you know, what we've learned from, you know, books by Atul Gawande and others who've talked about kind of checklists um, and the more kind of medicine can be practiced with that checklist mentality, the less likely we are to leave a step out and make a mistake. Um, So there are many technologies now that are enabling that kind of checklist ability 
whether that's through sort of an iPad interface in the operating room uh, to something in the patient's room. So I would look for technologies that are standardizing processes and helping um, the that provider, whether that's a nurse or a doctor, um, basically keep track of steps um, and 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 be a little bit more systematic in in their processes. So I think that's one. Um, I think the two other areas are kind of cultural, uh, but they relate to technology. And that the first is, I think that we have to do something about burnout among our clinicians. And whether those are nurses or physicians, the levels are just too high. And the reason um, this is a patient safety issue is it's pretty obvious. If you have uh, people that are that are not able to perform at the top of their game, uh, we're going to have mistakes, we're going to have liabilities. And so it's not just the right thing to do to, to solve our issues of, of overworked clinicians and burnout, but it, it's also a safety issue. And with technology, what we found is that, unfortunately, the EMR um, revolution in some ways added to burnout. People are complaining about too much documentation and I've got to stay late and, and put in my notes into the EMR. So technology is actually making it worse. So we agree. <laughs> and I think we, we are looking now at technologies that are not the EMR, but are designed to improve workflow to reduce time, uh, to help with staffing, uh, using kind of more of a technology-based scheduling system that's real time, uh, to help with um, operational efficiency and reducing time for certain tasks. So there's a whole slew of technologies, you name it, whether it's in the ICU or in the outpatient department that are looking at those workflow efficiency uh, issues. And I think that can really help with burnout uh, and that can really help with people feeling overworked. And I think the third area is, is more around how do you create a culture um, around mistakes and reporting mistakes. And there's some amazing work going out, coming out of LA County uh, and their quality and safety initiatives where it's kind of interesting, right? So something goes wrong it's less about a culture of blame, like it was Jane that did it or it was John that did it. It's more that what was it that happened and can we go back and figure out systematically um, what went wrong and how we would do it better. So they, they're, they're figuring out ways to take away a culture of blame and replace it with kind of investigation and, and, and collective problem solving. And it increases the rate at which people report that something is unsafe and then improves outcomes, you know, in terms of patient safety. So technology there can also be helpful in terms of creating anonymous reporting, um, facilitating that kind of feedback and, and data gathering. Well, this has been a very, very informative conversation. Uh, Dr. Sabai, you're a, a wealth of knowledge with everything healthcare technology related and, 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 and how to navigate your way through that. We really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. And you're going to be, uh, we're going to see you uh, next year at Congress? Yes. Wonderful. Looking forward to it. Wonderful. Dr. Sabai, thank you so much. I, I know our listeners got a lot out of this conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you, you, you for having me. You got it. And folks, so that's the... Uh, that's going to wrap up this edition of the Healthcare Executive Podcast. As always, just kind of stay tuned. We're, 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 we're coming at you again here very, very soon with another great edition. Thank you so much. This has been the Healthcare Executive Podcast, brought to you by the American College of Healthcare Executives. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider rating and reviewing on iTunes or your podcasting app of choice. And for more information, find us online at ACHE.org. Thank you.